We're ready. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a, another Sunday here in Olympia, Washington, where I am sitting. The rain is coming down kind of in droves. I was going to be gardening today after the poetry reading, but what a what better, what better way always for me to be spending my Sunday than to be with you all here for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And today is a most special Sunday where we have the absolute beautiful privilege to be spending time with the poets of Slate Roof Press in West, out of Western Massachusetts. We'll hear a little bit more in a moment from uh, editor uh, Janet McFadden. And, and then in addition to the poets, we're gonna be able to have a fabulous craft talk from um, the uh, printer and poet uh, Edward Raher. Um, so it's a un really unique program today, and I'm very glad that you're here to join in listening to all of the our poets for today. Uh, we're going to hear from Audrey Gidman, Susan Glass, Janet McFadden, Anna Warrock, and Richard Wallman, then again, also to hear about the craft of how, how books are put together. So I think we're in for just a wonderfully intimate afternoon of poetry, however, however the weather is treating you today and wherever you're joining us from. Well, as I mentioned, I'm Sandy Yunone, a host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Uh, I'm joining you today, as I mentioned, from Olympia, Washington. We've been here in Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, as most of you in the room know, since March of 2020, um, bringing poetry and poets from across the globe in all different kinds of formats. And one of the being able to do is when we have a special event. And today's special event um, is all the more special because I met editor Janet McFadden at an intimate gathering that happens every year in a field out, uh, out in Western Massachusetts. Uh, at, a, at, a, at a member poet here, uh, Jan Freeman's house, where we get together and we read on the 4th of July um, for the years that my mom and I are able to make it, a reading of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass in its entirety, the song of myself. And one year I had the absolute pleasure to meet Janet, she was, in, she was in the round of poets and we got talking and got connecting and who would know that a few years later uh, we, would be, uh, we would be Salmon Sisters and that I would have the joy of being able to host a program where we were able to feature the beautiful, 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 beautiful books that Slate Roof Press publishes. Well, just a little bit more, as you know, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry is intergenerational, intersectional, international group, and we're approaching 3,500 members on our Facebook group. Uh, we encourage you to post your postings about uh, upcoming readings and all of the special things that are happening to you in the world of poetry. 
Uh, it's been an amazing site of connection and ability for poets to network with each other and meet each other. And I have to say that while I've been on Facebook uh, in these past few months, I'm always astounded now when I see the matrix of how Cultivating Voices has brought people together that would likely not have, that it probably would have taken a different kind of way for them to meet. And I can always recognize that. And it's, it's, quite, a, it's, quite, a, it's quite a joy uh, for me personally to, to see that our humble, our humble group um, has, has made a difference uh, in the lives for so many poets. And I hope that's true for all of you today, just listening to the Poets of Slate Roof Press. So I'm gonna introduce first uh, Janet, who will talk a little bit about Slate Roof Press and its, its beginnings and its operations and uh, the beauty of what you do. And again, thank you for bringing the poets to our stage today. Oh gosh, you are so welcome. Thank you for having us. You know, it's really, wonderful to be presenting here after all, you know, a number of years of either being in the audience or doing the open mic. And yeah, I mean, I think about that serendipity of like you meet one person and then there are these ripple effects that keep continuing on, which has led to this. And this has just been a wonderful sus um, sustaining group throughout this on um, the pandemic and, and just going forward. And I'm definitely privileged to be introducing everyone to Slate Roof Press and all our poets. And, you know, we're sort of a ripple effect organization also. We are a collaborative publisher based in Western Massachusetts. We got our start as an outlet for poets of Franklin County, Massachusetts, which was and may still be the, po the poorest county in Massachusetts as an outlet for their poetry. And then, um, so it, we're member run, everybody helps. I mean, I'm not, I mean, everybody amongst us is an editor. We all edit each other's stuff. I am the managing editor, which means I keep track of all the nuts and bolts of the organization. But we've been around since 2004, um, introducing new voices in poetry with limited edition art, art quality chapbooks. And all of us were involved with all all parts of the organization. People do book fairs and presentations and readings, or we do promotion, we do bookstores accounts, we provide feedback on each other's manuscripts, we proof each other's manuscripts when they are going to um, production. And then we all can converge on Ed Rayer's shop in Northfield in order to actually assemble the books. So here's a sample of the book. This is Anna. Warrock's book, who she will be showing a little bit more about it, but uh, these books are, and Ed, I don't know how much you're going to talk about this either, but the books are constructed with this tab, tabbed um, cover, and inside, I don't know if you can see it, but the postcard for the outside cover gets pasted in there, and we would all gather in there and paste these things in there, so that when you have when you see it from the front, you're looking at the cutout of the actual, you know, sometimes these are just actually postcards that we post in there. Um, when it's time for the poet's book to go into production, they work very, very um, closely with Ed Rayer. Although every book is different, they all show the mark of the poet. Um, this is Susan's book. This is my book. This is Richard's book. And they have the die cuts, which are the cutouts. They have special uh, fly leaves. I don't know, Ed, you can tell people what a fly leaf is. I don't actually know what it is, but it's, it's the page inside. So for Anna's book, she has this very translucent fly leaf, which it's probably a little hard to see here, but you can see the poem that comes right through the paper. And since it's about snowfall, it kind of fits. It's called New Moon Snowfall, there it is. And we use local artwork to the best we can. So my book, so on the cover is a posterized image of a um, photograph. 
and it's a die cut of a sickle moon. So when you open up, there's this lovely fly leaf of this kind of glittery blue green paper and the full moon is there. And then you open it up again, even bigger moon. I don't, and then you open it up again. And this photograph was taken by my husband. And there's just a little, little tiny part of this that was blown up and posterized for the cover. Um, and we're also incredibly lucky to have uh, the artistic vision of Heidi Meissner, who is a woodblock artist, who did the um, artwork for Susan Glass's book. And Susan, I'm gonna show them your book just a little bit. So on the outside, we have this image of a deer about to burst its way through the cover here. And then the fly leaf, let's see if you can see it at all. I'm not sure, it's braille. You can, see, you can feel the braille and not exactly. It's a little hard to get into the light here. I don't know. Sandy, maybe you can get it better. And then you go to the um, title page, which has another image by Heidi, plus Ed's lovely um, deer hoof prints and some braille. And then the deer totally bursts through here, here. Um, and there is a fold out poem in braille in the middle. It was the shortest poem because Braille is a really big format. Anyway, I'll let Ed talk about that. I'm assuming he will. So every year we bring in members through a contest, which we are running right this second. At, um, it's a local contest this year, which means it's limited to poets in Western Massachusetts or the Brattleboro area in Vermont. And that's because we want to expand our on the ground presence here. And we actually need some really live bodies right here. So it's local. So if you are from this area or you know any poets from the, the area that have a nice chat book and would like to become part of a really vibrant organization, send it in because we are reading. So without further ado, maybe we should read some poetry. Thank you so much, Janet. And uh, we're gonna come back to hear some poetry from Janet. But first, we're going to hear the poetry of Audrey Gidman. And again, thank you for, um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear how a collective um, works to put together poet, you know, put together poetry, chapbooks. Um, it's, a, it's a unique, it's a, your, your, organ, your, the organizing of the press, um, each one is so unique. And so I love that we got to hear how, how you all work together on each other's books. Well, today first, we're gonna hear from Audrey Gidman. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm so excited to hear, um, I'm so excited to hear your work as I know that there are folks here in the audience that have come also specifically to hear you today, Audrey. A little bit about Audrey for all of you. Um, Audrey Gidman is a queer poet living in Maine and her poems can be found vastly, I will say, um, in places like the New Heron Barks, Bird Coat Quarterly, The Shore, Rust and Moth, I love Rust and Moth, and Swim Every Day, uh, edited by one of our uh, members, uh, Jen Karetnik here, and many, many other places you can find Audrey's work. She currently serves as the assistant poetry editor for Gigantic Sequins and is the chapbook's editor for Newfound. Her chapbook, Body Psalms, was winner of the Elise Wolf Prize and will be joining the illustrious catalog of Slate Roof Press later this year. Please join me in welcoming Audrey Gidman. Hi everyone. Sandy, thank that was so generous. Thank you. Um, your enthusiasm made me enthusiastic about myself. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for having us here. This is so exciting. Um, 
I'm currently in Florida. Um, it's very tropical here. I'm not accustomed to it. And so there's um, thunder that you might hear in the background because I'm in the jungle. Um, and there's also uh, a newborn um, very close to where I'm sitting. So if you hear very tiny cries, that that's, that's what that is. Um, so I, yeah, my, my little book is coming out in the fall. Um, it's called Body Psalms. It has transformed a lot uh, in the time that I've been working on it. So it started out as this project that was centered in um, deconstructing the Psalms. I have this obsession with God and um, deconstructing God and dismantling God. Um, and I was really curious about what that could look like. I'm really interested in white space. So I really wanted to actually fracture um, this idea of the Psalm. So that's where the book, um, this is the genesis of the book. Uh, and over time, it has really shifted as my other obsessions have really matured um, or transformed. It's really shifted into this exploration also of um, grief and trauma and the body and how those ideas and God are not actually separate from landscape environment and landscape and environment is not actually separate from grief, from our grief, um, from the things that happen to our bodies, from the memories that our bodies may or may not have access to. Um, so you'll hear, I haven't actually decided what I'm going to read yet. I sort of decide as I go. So it's emergent for you and for me, um, but all of those things are present in whatever I could possibly read to you. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm up to. And I am, I think, going to start with a very short poem called Prayer. Take this chicory up from the ground, O oh Lord. Tangle of wild daisy, white clover between fingers and teeth. Delphinium, comfrey, peony, rose. The wind sings and sings, whispers a spell, roots and small spines. St. John's wort, red as a crushed cardinal, cupped in my hand, rubied, blood swift. Amen. Mm, I think that I will read now, actually, a poem called Psalm. This is my first fractured psalm. Take me to the inseam of the mountain, O oh God, where honey meets sand, all grit and bone and dripping hive. Take me to the tree that knew how to set root beside the moss laid cliffside soaked with rain the day I fell into the pine shoulder, knees red as jasper and blood garnet. Take me to the mouth of the cave that dropped me down into that canyon. Let it rain, O oh God, into that bowl. Let it cover the rapture of buckled hips, scraping the mountain, the wall, the granite striated as a rib cage, and the sun dipping yellow to the east. God, take me to the tree that knew I'd forgotten how to kneel. And I will read, this is a companion piece of that poem actually that I wrote many years later. Um, that poem was secretly about uh, this time that I almost fell off the side of my very favorite mountain and was caught by the branch of a tree that I didn't know was there. And the mountain is called uh, Tumble Down. It really, um, as you might imagine, changed the resonance of my reverence for that mountain. <laughs> um, so this poem is called Tumble Down and it's after um, Tiana Clark, the brilliant Tiana Clark. I gyre, I spin out and tumble, trip over stones, 
I climb the mountain. I fall back down the mountain, carrying a creek in my pockets, water in my hands. I cup, I willow, I carve pelvis, I bowl, I belly, I crawl on my knees. I listen still, I weep singing, I ruby, I bloody, I fish for garnets become gold, just water and the sound of water, just horses. I horse and dogwood my way up north, magnolia, sky, whirl and trip back into canyon. I slip on rock face knees, red as jasper, I become pine, I dazzle, I don't die this time, I dazzle. Hmm. I think, okay, this is, um, this is a poem. It was one of the first poems that I really wrote with this idea of um, trauma as a somatic thing. Um, in, in mind, and I, I wrote, I read a lot of Robert Bly and a lot of Ocean Vong in like the same day. And I was like, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write about trauma. <laughs> um, so that's how this poem came to be. And it's, it's sort of the, the beginning of this idea that I'm really trying to um, chip away at in my full length that I'm working on, which is what I'm calling today, I'm calling it, um, uh, trauma explorative ecopoetics. <laughs> That's what it's called today. That's my big idea. Um, trauma and landscape and God and semantics and how they're not actually separate. This poem is called Trauma Theory. Forgive me, I have been this body. Forgive me, I have seen so much this body knows. I think I am a tree made of hands. I think I can't get empty enough to know what I'm dealing with. This body is a drought of massed years. Let me begin again. Here is a girl kneeling. Here is a girl on her knees, a girl on her knees in the dark. She can't remember a shadow that disappears. She can't remember why the dark scares her. She tries for years. Owls outside the window, birch and sycamore scratching glass, her skin a tired storm, forgive me, I have seen this story a thousand times, forgive me, how do I write this poem differently next time? The owls have gone home, but home is what? A body, a prayer for a clean break, a body, a tired storm, forgive me, there is no clean break. War has a smell, forgive me. There are owls in this poem somewhere, a girl on her knees, afraid of windows. The window is shut. The window is a window made of hands, a body kneeling. She knows the storm by the inside of its name. She forgets herself. No, forgive me. I forget what I came here to say. Yeah, trauma, cyclical repeating, getting nowhere until we get somewhere. <laughs> um, I, of course, have not kept track of time. Um, am I done? <laughs> Someone Why don't you close us out with one more? Okay, okay. One more, one more, one more. Which one? Hmm, I want to read this one. Okay, this poem is called Late Summer. Was uh, lying in the grass, late summer. The goldenrod bloomed early this year. I lie in the grass, second guessing my own beauty. So tired from working the soil, these wounds my grandmother left and my mother that live in me like stones in the garden. These feathers, these scarlet beans. Ticks make their way up from the ground, parting the dark tangle of leg hair in search of sacrament. I suppose this makes me holy, worthy of being desecrated or at least 
bitten into. I want to close my eyes, but not now. I'm waiting for the flowers to grow taller. I want to be here when they die, full of blood and all the mothers who saw me coming, feet red as rubies kissing the ground. Thank you so much for your time and your attention for being here. Oh, I love, I love an opening to a reading that begins the way it began with your work, Audrey. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having that, the presence to bring the attention to flora and the attention to trauma together. In the, in, in the way that you in the way that you do that through a unique its own unique poetry religion is what I will say. Thank you so much, Sandy. You're so generous. <laughs> I really appreciate all of those things that you just said. Thank you. Well, folks, we are here today gifted by the presence of the poets from Slate Roof Press. We've just heard from Audrey Gidman, whose chapbook will be released later this fall, Body of Psalms. Come back and read with us when it's out. We'll have you in a new books, in a new book showcase, I think. It would be wonderful to feature you. Well, next, uh, we move to, you know, of course, I wish I had Audrey's, but I have to wait till later this year. But I do have, I'm holding in front of our camera, the beautiful, I don't know the color palette, but it's, for me, it's more like an olive-ish green with this, the die cut of the face, of the head of a deer in a, in a woodcut block. And this is the work of Susan Glass, the wild language of deer. Susan Glass's poetry also appears in numerous places. And I, I get, I, lo I love the names of the journals in particular here for Susan. The Snowy Egret, the Broad River Review, Birdland Journal, and Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California. Susan, has held a residency at the Covington Community of the Arts and also has her MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Again, her chapbook, The Wild Language of Deer, won the Elise Wolf Prize. And she and her husband, John, share their home with her guide dog, Omni whose combined work, work ethic and silliness ensure that all three of them, all three of them remain irreverent, active, and deeply loved. Would you please welcome Susan Glass. Thank you, Sandy. That's such a generous and deep introduction and uh, go irreverence. Do we agree? Good quality to have at some level at the same time that we entertain reverence both together. Um, so delighted to be here today with my friends and colleagues at Slate Roof and with all of you. I'm going to begin this reading with a poem called June Bedtime Story, which is my uh, child, first child exploration of God. In the wild light before cataracts, God was marigold seed sprouting from between mother's fingers, my first nursery to water and smell. Together we tamped the earth, 
our forearms and knees touching. She stood and I, child god at ear level with patchwork knees, listened to a wheelbarrow on stone, pulled by mother hands, earth gloved and honest. The flapping burlap apron of mother lap, the snips, the trowel. God became dwarf plants and plastic six packs and spiderweb roots clinging. And the seedlings begot evening, smelling of onions. I crouched in the basin our knees had made, unsure how seed graves could spawn life, afraid of leaving them to their dark work, afraid of running away. Their godmother, my godmother, in, in all its ways, my mother was my garden god, bird teacher after nature itself, um, and lives in just about everything. Here's a poem about reading, and it's about the, the joyous generosity of our brain and its willingness to change shape to bring us understanding. It's called Letter to Visual Cortex. Perhaps you are not my subject of address, but your reputation for flexibility precedes you, as my fingertips and I well know. We were there, you see, when you captured the meaningless pebbles, ticklish filigree on cardboard paper. Our first word, rain, arrived in contracted braille. Cell one, three dots left, one at mid-level right. Cell two, one dot at top left. Cell three, two subtler dots, better mannered, less demanding, nestling mid-range, mid-finger pad. It was, in fact, raining in the leaf-flecked garden. Sycamore and oak muted the drops that hissed like skillet garlic. So too, those dots beneath my right hand's index finger murmured toward recognition. That first neural path from fingertip to visual cortex bypassed my eyes and forgave their shyness. With one word, the new wiring laid itself into place. Uh, I think I will read, um, yes. I will read the title poem, The Wild Language of Deer, with so much thanks to um, Ed and Heidi who helped uh, make this happen and to everyone in Slate Roof who helped us raise this deer from fawn to mighty being. The deer appears in my family room and I throw down every myth I've ever read. Great stags in the Danish king's forest, northern stars flickering in their antlers, Artemis Buck avenged. Irish fairies milking hinds. This doe's bones are harder than the maple piano. Her hooves puncture the oak floor, cut jagged braille stanzas to the kitchen's rim. Her knees dispose of chairs. Her shoulders thrust musky scented into the breakfast nook and the head mounted over the fireplace is like any face emerging from a dream that bewilders, that asks, what is this place? Her body is a dark space under basement stairs where we flatten together on our bellies. I pull wet sentences from the clay of her flanks. They smell like fermented potatoes. They are the mute story I'm telling of her furious severed head. They are poems that will never domesticate, that welcome this wild language back into my home. I, I grew up uh, in, in a family of fascinating women, a clever mother, two clever grandmothers. And when I was small, I didn't always know the difference between my, my closest DNA biological grandmothers and the grandmothers of the trees. So this is called Grandmother Oak. You claimed the back hill before fences, patios, paths. So we made you an altar there. Railroad tie steps guiding our feet, your children and rosemary sprouting around you, tumbled sharp leaves for bare heels, prickly acorns, and always 
a summer toad napping beneath a log. I thought your branches were saying racket up, racket up, racket up, until I learned there were acorn woodpeckers roosting and you, their granary, granary, granary tree. One January night, you gathered all California's wind into your roaring hair. I climbed your hill and wrapped my arms around your girth as far as they would reach. My hands did not touch. I rested my cheek on your rough skirt. Your windy voice swelled and your still body anchored me. Do I have time for one more? Please. <laughs> I, I want to be so fair to everyone. Uh, this is a poem about father, love, and fear. Skiing lesson. It's only a bunny slope, but I'm a box tortoise with stilt-legged shorebirds clamped to my shell. His poles arrest my speed but it's all gravity and cross tips conspiring to pitch me head first. The bindings hate my ankles, won't release, bet on it. He bangs his pole, bend your knees, lean, your feet are a V. He's using his math homework voice, crimping his words, breathing hard so he won't explode. I have to please him. He taught me to walk, to follow his voice. Bailey's don't quit. The big muscle in his neck throbs when he says this. If I touched it now, we might be all right, but I'm 13 and my fingers are tourniquets on my poles and my dad, my father is waiting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. Everyone, you have been listening to the exquisite poetry of Susan Glass from her chapbook. Here it is, holding up the cover again so everyone can see the wild language of deer. Again, folks, these, these chapbooks, like I'm hugging them. They're just, they're so gorgeous in their construction, but the construction of the poetry is a mirror for how they are housed as a collection. And I wanna just say about Susan's work, what I, really appreciated and, and I'm so glad that you read all the poems, but I really, I really love the poem letter to, um, I really love the letter to visual cortex because so much of this collection answers that question is what is place and what inhabits place, but also is about the intricacies of language and how, how the, the, various, the various ways we navigate language is. And uh, it weaves itself beautifully through this collection. So thank you, Susan, for such evocative work and for sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we move next to Janet McFadden. And if it were not for Janet as the managing editor, we would not be here today listening to this particular constellation in the sky of poets. Uh, and I'm so grateful to have Janet uh, not only um, bring the poets of Slate Roof Press to Cultivating Voice for our listening pleasure this afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you are. Uh, for, some, for some folks in the room, it's actually Monday morning uh, already. 
<laughs> we were not, we, but we get the bonus, of course, of, of how Janet herself is one of the poets of Slate Roof Press. And so we get to hear also her wonderful work, which I, I, I respect and marvel at. Um, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful. I'm just so grateful to have the connection with you now. And let me share a little bit more of the formal biography of Janet with all of you. Janet McFadden is the author of five poetry collections. Her latest and newest, Slate, State of Grass, State of Grass, is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry in 2023. Janet's had work appear most recently in these wonderful journals, Calix, Cranog, the Naugatuck River Review, edited by um, Laurie de Rogers, um, another, another pillar of the Western Massachusetts um, and uh, poetry community. Persimmon tree, scientific American, soul lit, sweet, again, another, another, another journal I absolutely adore, and tiny seed journal, Janet, is a recipient of a 2022 Massachusetts Cultural Council grant, as well as a Fine Arts Work Center fellowship and a SIL real residency. Please, please join me in welcoming the spirit and the heart and the work of Janet McFadden. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. So <laughs> um, how do I start here? Well, you know, my Slate Roof chapbook is actually fairly old. It was published in um, 2012. And so it was interesting for me to go back and start looking at this because I wanted to read from this book because this was a Slate Roof um, presentation. And back then, I mean, I'm still the same person, but I, I still, I guess I'm still emerging, but I feel like I was more emerging back then and I didn't really know who I was. And so I went around and around and around on the same subjects, which were root vegetables, dirt, um, 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 dogs, sex, body, around and around and around and around and around. And my um, State of Grass, the Salmon Poetry book that's coming out, came out after the I don't know, I went through one of these magical metamorphoses in my later life, such that all of a sudden, at least to me, I have finally understood my personal narrative in a way I never did before. So anyway, I will just start here. You can hold it in your mouth like chocolate. What comes of this is desire, and if you taste it, what comes is plenty, it is so sweet. Then what comes is the point of stillness inside the body. That is why cats are so liquid. That is why the leaf floats down and down in the warm air, though it is fall. And thoughts slow like a train, coming to a halt in the middle of a cornfield at night in October, leaves glinting on the ground. You could get off here in the darkness, quietly talking and looking up at the stars whose light has traveled from so far away and so long ago. And that poem's called The Future Melts. And I, when my mother was dying of dementia, I went to visit her which proved to be the day before she died, although none of us knew that that was gonna happen. Um, and I'm sitting next to her in the nursing facility and she is completely unresponsive. You know, there was no way for me even to really know she was alive other than I could see her breathing. 
And I talked with her and I sang to her and I talked with her some more. And finally, I started reading some poems. And then I read this poem. And I swear when I read this poem, this change came over her and I sensed that she was actually there. Um, and I've always felt that this poem gave her permission to leave. So I almost always start my readings out with it. It calms me down. Um, so my, I had a dog that was lovely inside and horrible outside. And every time we had a full moon, she would want to go out on the deck and she would wake the entire neighborhood by barking at the moon or about at anything. A true spirit, bloodlines, time stops, a camera flash, the world struck dumb by moonlight. From sound sleep, I stumble onto the deck with the dog in moon-soaked fur. Every hair sniffs the air, sniffs the stunned bodies of trees, limbs raised, skirts of dried bracken around their knees. Her ribs conceal a wind tunnel, sucking all creeping things through her nose to the abdomen, hoof, scale, claw. Unseen, except in dreams where a twig snaps under a shadow. Unknown, except for smell or sound, horns vanishing behind branches. A confusion of senses, a freeze of beasts and savagery, young Goodman Brown at the edge of darkness, having heard those demonic cacklings and screams, wood frog, screech owl. Who knows what bloodlines run from the brain's web to the forest floor? Those piercing eyes in the woods, which once were ours, we called it home. And Um, so I'm not paying any attention to what I thought I was going to read. Anyway, um, so now I'm going to go into the dirt. Um, this poem is told literally from the point of view of a potato. I like potatoes. I think they're really interesting. And they have these eyes, lots and lots of eyes. So this is called Through the Eye of a Potato. Lying there in a black furrow, I saw how sunlight lit the hard earth stroke the brown wrinkled face of my grandfather dozing beneath me. Sooner or later, his head would flower. Already he loved burlap and brown paper bags. And in my greening, I mimicked him, brushing marl and peat from a dozen eyes. I sensed an uprising out of everything dark and underfoot and possibly out of my own heart, if only I knew how to see. My grandfather wheezed. He said, study it, girl. It's there for the taking. I copied his dusty squint, lying motionless by the hour until rain burst open the green heart of the ground. And I knew I loved water and round, ugly things, puffballs and toads grunting in litters. Everything living was demanding its right to grow round and fat and put down roots. My grandfather, drilled frilly corkscrews in fields and in my mind, reeled out vine after vine of pale fuzzy leaves until he was wreathed in them like a happy harvesting god. And though I was full to bursting, I knew nothing of the blossoms that on moonless nights potatoes dream of, clustered together in clods of dirt, and nothing at all of roots, except how to hold tight to my grandfather as he tightened his grip on the earth. Um, that's a poem that will be in the Salmon Poetry book. Um, as I've always felt it was a subtext, it was a subtext for rising up, rising up out of the, the, the ground. Okay, I'm still sort of in the dirt here with, a, um, this is a dead dog poem. When I was getting my um, MFA, we were always told you never write poems about dogs. That was just off limits, especially not about your dog that died, because that was just way too sentimental. And the worst thing us poets can, we poets can ever do is um, cave into sentimentality. 
That's just absolutely terrible. Anyway, this is called For a Dog. It seemed the line between thought and thing was blurry in your mind. The essence of meat being more than the morsel itself, which vaporized under a consuming desire. Surely such a will continues to burn in the dark earth, wild with the ecstasy of your own smell, drawing dirt and decay to it like a magnet, the seething microscopic filings gnawing and honing and polishing your long bones. Now, what you most longed for, you have become, the marrow, the blood, the gut. Skin, fur, and feathers, oh, all that beauty you would gladly investigate. You had an engineer's instinct to expose the inner workings. As now, you have been exposed, your pelt laid to one side, a sensuous shining. One night, a small black bear padded into my dream, restless for the door, and I took its collar off and opened up. And so I watched you go, released from your body and chain. You knew what you needed, as the bear knew, asking to be let out into the night, no more collar and leash, a dark force in a dark world, running with the wind wherever it might. I actually did have the dream, yeah, about this bear that came into my bedroom and wanted to go out, which of course, when my dog wanted to go out, that's what she would do. But I took her to the door and I took her collar off and let her go. Um, all right, so now, go back here. Just did this, another dog poem. Too many dog poems. All right, this is called Stung. I cannot read, but the voice can read. The voice that is mine and not mine. The hand can follow the sentences line by line with its finger. The book that is held opens itself and bees drop one by one from the pages. Sometimes a poem will split open in my hands like milkweed. Sometimes I spread the long grass apart to see the ridged promise of an iris, furred blue tongue drawing the literate bees. The dance and journey come on me. I am stung over the flower tops, through the mosslands, following a map given to me by strangers. My life depends on it now. The hive swirls dark around the mind, glittering in the peripheral vision and laced with dripping honey. The world says, eat of me and die. Oh, eat of me and die. And so, I leave myself. And one more, or do I have time for two? Go ahead, do two. <laughs> do two, all right, all righty, all righty. What shall I do? All right, vegetable. Well, is this, a vegetable? this is a food poem, food poem. And it's a winter poem too, so I'm totally out of season. It's called Wind Rising Housebound. I have my spatula and my spoon. I soak black mushrooms in their own blood. I slice the fermented tofu, stir frying secretly in the night. Roads are closed, the visibility zero. The oil heats up, it, is, it has reached the threshold and in goes the ginger, the hoisin sauce, breasts of squab, gnarled carrot, the soy. I am stirring and stirring the tree ears. The snow comes tumbling faster. I cannot see my neighbor's light. I cannot hear the animals sniffing or see their lantern eyes watching out of the wood. But somehow the message gets out, Chinese food on Jackson Hill Road and suddenly everybody is hungry. Slipping out of fleeces and long winter underwear, they take their spouses to bed. They shake and they holler while the storm swirls and I furiously stir the shining strips of naked bean curd. Okay. I'll read one last poem that's going to be in State of Grass. Um, new poem, but still, well, anyway, new poem. It's a little bit of a Valentine. It's called Be Mine. 
Little body, I am taken with your puff and huff and groan. Little knees that work so hard, jackknife elbow and jangling groin, little coin slot, little piggy bank, little hair on neck and arm and cheek. Thank you for standing up and being seen. Thank you, puffy flesh of it, the belly of it, the bloody sack of it. Dear body, I am in love, smitten by your 10 toes and matching toenails, your foot arch and knobbly ankle, knuckle bone, collar bone, funny bone, sending me in stitches, air rushing through the front door and breaking out the back. Oh, body, all that I have is yours, my bobby pins and bank account, my stocked larder and heavy grieving, little boredoms and peals of laughter. Oh, all this is yours to put to fat and butter, all that has made me, dog that I am. I follow you everywhere, panting with desire. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. You know, I love that we started with a prayer and that we, that we get to hear a Valentine. And I also want to say that anytime a person can come to, can come to the stage and say, I'm going to read a series of poems that combines the idea, root vegetables, dogs, dirt, sex, and the body. Like, I, like I'm like, Yes, I'm leaning in to listen to that particular constellation. I'm leaning in to listen to that particular constellation, not expecting to have those five things show up in the same constellation. I just, I absolutely, I love that about the surprise of your work. And I always have, and I always have. Everyone, you've just been hearing the poetry from managing editor Janet McFadden from Slate Roof Press. We're featuring the poets today from that Western Massachusetts collaborative of poetry. And we move next to Anna Warrock. Again, I really want to encourage you all. You know, the reason that we feature presses and um, different presses from time to time, um, particularly, particularly small independent presses, is to just really encourage support for the presses. And uh, these, you're hearing the poetry, but again, and you're going to hear. How, how did and, and imagined. Anna's is, is I just took my breath away when I received it in the mail. And um, her collection is called From the Other Room. It's a burgundy mulberry. My palette is off today, but I just, I love the colors. I love the color palette of these chapbooks also. So I wanted to just announce that it's like a mulberry burgundy. And of course they'll tell, I'm sure I'll get corrected about what the color actually is. <laughs> well, Anna Warrock's latest book, as I mentioned, is From the Other Room. And it was a Slate Roof Press chat book award winner. Of course it was. Besides appearing in The Sun, The Madison Review, Conduit, and other journals, her work is also anthologized in Kiss Me Goodnight, Women Writing on Childhood Mother Loss, which was a Minnesota Book Award finalist. Anna's poems also have been choreographed, set to music, and inscribed in a Boston area subway station. I wish I still lived in Boston to be able to read the poetry in the subway stations. Anna also has held numerous 
seminars um, held space for conversations around understanding grief and loss through poetry. Please welcome Anna to this room as we hear from the other room. Thank you, Sandy. And again, thanks for your generosity and thanks to the whole Cultivating Voice team for bringing us. Thanks to all of you for coming on a lovely Sunday afternoon in May. Um, as Sandy mentioned, it's called From the Other Room. And um, as the books have shown, once you get inside, the, the um, title page is actually a reflection. So there is the other room. It is a book about loss and living with loss. And the other room is the room that we build for our beloved dead so they may live with us. So the first poem is um, about my mother's death. Uh, she died when I was 16. And this uh, took me a few years to write, as you can imagine, to understand what that moment was like. The outline. In 12th grade, Miss Warren kept me after English class to ask, do you know this paper doesn't make sense? I looked at my three typed pages, puzzled. So she showed me how to outline and arrange thoughts. I had learned all that younger, but had forgotten the patterns when death scrambled my bones with my mother's. Miss Warren and I sat by the oak desk, and she led me step by step back to reason, asking what I wanted to say, asking what I thought might come next. She would wait a long time in silence patiently because she saw I had to go a long way off to recollect something that answered the question and did not signify the impossible, which I had learned when death took my mother away. And once I had accepted the impossible, what was there to say? It disturbed me to look at the faces of my classmates, to see their guileless self-absorption. But when Miss Warren said, A leads to B leads to C, and you can number inside the letters one and two and three, I learned that to think again was not to betray what I had witnessed, but to follow a map that led to her oasis where she had us reading James Joyce to learn epiphanies, how things come together or must come apart. And you can see it in a glance or in the snow. Later that year, too tired to do drugs or sit in a back seat with a boy, I went to Warren's house for tea. I told her my mother hadn't died of cancer, like I'd said to everyone, but of alcohol, and my father was drinking again. And she said, it's a surprise, isn't it, when you know your family isn't happy? A, B, and C, one, two, and three. Springs Lament. So it's April again, the trees all hue and shape of green, mottled, bright, 
leaves feathery, yellow green, blue green, branches budded and bud broken open. Each tree has, wants its green. Although my sister has been dead three years, it's good that trees turn to leaves each April, unstoppable. Even the great hole in the earth that swallows everything, terror, abiding love, greens up. So a tree turns green and green and green, then there's the shade. I will not let go of that, the shadow under the tree, dark, deep, forgiving in all that green, forgiven, that's what I meant, forgiven. I'll read the title poem, which came from a dream. He said, they are the dead, you know. In the dream, I hear voices from the other room. So I walk into that living room, but they, a man in a dark business suit, listening to a woman in a blue dress and pumps are just standing up from the sofa, turning away, plans made toward the doorway at the back. And they start toward the other room where also voices, conversations, they are taking their papers and leaving the room I entered through another door, I never see their faces, the plans, and they are going, should I? Yes, I'll follow. Unconcerned, they do not look back or call, might not even know I am. I never see it the other room. I am anxious and go to the door that opens into an unlit hall and their backs spread like ink into the dim. I'm going to finish with two new poems. In fact, this is going to appear in Conduit, which is a wonderful, uh, unique magazine. I'm very happy to be in there. This is Self-Portrait with Recycling. Like in a photograph, sunset tints the bus windows. Riders look out. You watched lurid pink purple clouds traveling down the street. At 2 a.m. you enter the kitchen where twilight rays stretch over the airspace from the neighbor's kitchen light. Your window above the sink, enough to see by. Is the car parked at an angle, theirs or the tenants? Do they take out their recycling? Do they bolt their tables to the floor? Does that tree, a shadow in the corner, have yellows and is it dying? Later, your older face, who knew? Everything looks so far away. And this is a dozen for silence. It's like a baker's dozen, but um, instead of 13, it really is 12. A dozen for silence. Fragments, splinters, people 
break it. When you watch me dream, is my pulse also soundless? If I forget my dreams, do I forget I have slept? Passers-by hold expectations unvoiced. Rests in music produce music. The augers wash the feet of a person shrouded by dust. It could be said, I do not exist. Then I wonder when I will speak an aspen quaking in the woods. The quiet bird flies, hear the bird fly past, the unsung past. Monks fast, so they might hear whether God speaks. Alone or with one person, or with several, how does my stillness differ? A person wreathed in silence wears branches of feathers. Thank you. I'm just taking a breath. I'm just taking a breath. Oh, his poems. And from the other room, they just reached me. They just reached me very deeply. And uh, I didn't share this before, but I'm so glad that you read the outline because it's a poem that I actually shared with my students earlier this week. I, I direct a writing center and I wanted, I wanted them to hear a poem that connects a narrative about the writing process with a much, with a vaster, with a vaster narrative than the writing process. And I thought it was just the perfect, perfect poem for them to experience. And so um, you can imagine my absolute, I mean, I'm just so moved to be able to hear it today. Thank you, Sandy, thank you. These poems in From the Other Room, they have a precision to them as you've just heard, but that precision is overly matched by the introspection that comes from that precision. And I wanna go back to um, the poem he said, they are the dead, you know. And just mention that it's act, it's literally the poem that when you open, it is the it is the perfect center of the poem, and you get to see the knot of thread when you open it. And bring your attention to those first few opening lines. In the dream, I hear voices from the other room. So I walk into that living room and the break of the line on living. It reminds me also of the conversation that, that Marie Howe also has in, in What the Living Do. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for these poems. Thank you, Sam. In perpetuity. I would say not just for today, but in perpetuity. Folks, please, if you are feeling inspired to purchase a collection or many collections today from Slate Roof Press, our poets today, in the chat, of course, here. And for those of you listening after the fact or listening live um, on Facebook, uh, we'll have the links to those books um, tomorrow for you. But you could rush right over 
to Slate Roof Press's website as well. If you can't wait on Facebook, I encourage you all to partake of these just exquisite collections that we're hearing from today. Well, before we get to hear about the making of the books, um, we're going to hear from our last poet, which is Richard Wallman. Richard's collection is Changeable Gods. You're gonna hear. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try not to uh, wreck the reading by, by overstating what you're about to hear from this beautiful collection. Um, and what I would like to share with you uh, about Richard is that in addition to changeable gods, Richard is the author of Evidence of Things Seen, A Cemetery Affair, and of course, Changeable Gods. His awards include the Elise Wolf Prize, the Gulf Coast Prize, and the Anna Davidson Rosenberg Award for poems on the Jewish experience. His poems appear in New England Review, Crazy Horse, Prairie Schooner, and American Journal of Poetry. And he is professor of literature and creative writing at Simmons University in that wonderful metropolis of the Boston area. Feel free to check out Richard's poems and learn more about um, his poetry as well as his artwork at his website. Please give a very generous welcome to Richard Wallman. Thank you so much, Sandy, uh, for your introduction and for having us all. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. I also just want to thank my colleagues at Slate Roof Press. Um, I can't overestimate what a privilege it is to, be, to read with you, to hear your poems. It doesn't matter how many times I've heard them. It's like the first time. And I just, I love you all. OK, so you saw the cover. Um, so the cover has a painting of mine, which is uh, uh, acrylic. And it's a winter. Uh, it's a lake. It's actually really the river, Merrimack River, and um, in the winter, uh, which is near where I live. And you know, the fact that I could use my own artwork uh, at Slate Roof Press was huge for me because because the they're not just there for how they look; they're part of the poems themselves. And and I would also add that what I've come to learn at Slate Roof is that the object of the book, everything about it. Uh, from font to uh, the construction to even the texture of the cover, which, which, which has a lot of texture, is really part of the meaning of the book. Um, and, and so thank you to Ed, Ed Rayer for his brilliance. Um, it just felt so good uh, to be involved in every part of one's own book. It's, it's a rare thing. The other image is a sculpture of mine, a photo of a sculpture on the title page. Um, which is also in Maudsley Woods, which, which is, you know, one of the main settings of the poems. Um, and it was kind of cool to be able to include that. And I finished it about 10 hours before I had to send the whole thing to Ed. So it was a little crazy. These poems began as emails. Uh, they're love poems, but I like to think they're more than that too. Uh, they began as emails when I had been sculpting all night, learning how to sculpt in wood. Uh, and then would realize that the sun was coming up. So I'd look out of this tiny window in my third floor and be home to my girlfriend um, and send it that day. Uh, and I did this for about 40 days. 30 of the days are in the chapel. It's also dedicated to Sarah Hannah, my pal, and a truly gifted poet, uh, Boston poet, uh, who passed away in 2007. Normally, I read a lot of the poems that that mention her. She she's throughout this this book, but today I'm going to do a different grouping than I than I have been doing. 
because I realized I've been talking so much about Sarah that my lover uh, has just disappeared from the landscape in my reading. So I'm going to try something different today. And I'm going to, you know, they're very, very brief. So um, I'm not going to really speak between them, but just pause. Blue and viridian coming up behind it, a green that seems to love the tops of trees, green that won't stay long, not long. The sky would have things yellow, wants the sun to linger in the river, mix with blue to make that momentary color, neither sky nor sun nor river, green that is a woman, as the Chinese say. You can't stop looking for a second. You can't stop looking because she can't stay. Snowed last night. Oh, this is a bad mood poem. It happens. It snowed last night, but you could never tell. A flurry that looked like gnats in the light after sundown. Where you were, it was clear and not cold enough for snow. I was in the northern part of my mind where nothing could be warm. I was leaving against my will, leaving you. Wasn't I the reason for bringing on the chill that made you take your violet scarf, drape it across your knees and shiver? On nights like these, I don't care which color the morning wants to be, call it ochre. Last night's fog finally lifted but you would never know it was morning. There's nothing to see. All pallet and no brush of a tree that would move the sky closer to the river. You're in your bed. I'm moving northward near the last border, looking for a flash of violet, your mind's hard luster that illuminates the brown earth. I can't see anything the gods offer when you are away. It's no use waiting for the days to lengthen. The clouds will hold whatever light comes before the last gives way to indigo, dark violet, almost black. Who's to say now we are settled, that the sky's changes won't hurt us? Who can tell us where we are if no stars break through? The two moons you left in the bedsheets, in the pillow, the impression of your hair, the faint rosette of blood on the blanket. This is the only landscape I know. This one, uh, this one is, is, uh, is, is a little bit of a cheat because all these poems are, are, are written out of absence, but this one was when I was seeing her sleep and how disturbed the sleep was. The goddess sleep lets fall her green curtain around you, her soft ribbon against your cheek, a mother who does not speak. You whisper to children who leap over roots the trees send along the path by the lake you return to. What happens you cannot say. You draw your knees to your face, become a cradle of your own making. I've borne storms more than once, convinced that love could never be enough to weather all that must be weathered if we are to last another morning. In the woods today, everything, I'm sorry, in the woods today, the trees were russet everything became red. And for once, neither calm nor storm could take you away from me. There was no one for miles with an opinion of us beneath the blue permeated with green, a green I'd never known, the green of lichen on brick, of leaves impressed in mud, 
green that could keep storms away for days. Tonight the sky finally was violet, the fog making it so while I drove away from you, your body walking slowly home. This time I couldn't tell you about the sky. What had it done to me? I had nowhere to go. Even the police car pulling me over turned suddenly and left me by the side of the road with its sand from the winter, filthy shreds of plastic stuck in the weedy overgrowth. I felt like a blameless man who knew he couldn't be trusted. These are the last fractions of sky reflecting everything we have seen, the last mornings we will have. And won't we in time need them back? Telling the story must surely change it, but this cannot be said. How different are the twin gods of want and need? You can't know one without the other. The snow doesn't need to know it's violet. I have always wanted to tell you. And I'll close with one more that loops back to the first one. The green almost gone isn't a woman bearing those streaks across last night's sky, diving westward, but not dying. It isn't doing anything. I won't say it isn't beautiful. We bear it out. We bear it out because we believe, even though love is not enough, we bear it out by making something of the blue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Again, you've been hearing the poetry of Richard Wallman from Changeable Gods that line, the twin gods of want, wants and needs. And also that twin reflection of absence and presence that runs, runs like a river through these linked sequence of poems. And I wanted to share with you all the epigraph to the book because I feel like that also just helps contextualize so beautifully. And, and this is from um, Jack Gilbert's poem, Tear It Down. We find out the heart only by dismantling what the heart knows. And that, and I feel like that's what the poems in this collection are constantly doing, you know, dismantling and showing us the both ands throughout absence, presence, wants, and needs. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing your poems and your artwork from Changeable Gods. Thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Well, everyone, we now get to um, hear, you've, you've heard the poets um, talking about the master printer and poet Ed uh, Reher, who is the visionary of how these collections um, come together along with and in collaboration with the poets. Um, and for today, to close out, we're going to be treated to hear a little bit more about the making um, of the making of the uh, Slate Roof Press's um, collections. Uh, let me share with you all that, um, that in addition to being a master printer, of course, that Ed is also a poet uh, and a member of the Slate Roof Press Collective, of course, and hails as a printer from Northfield, Massachusetts. He runs Swamp Press, publishing limited edition letterpress books of poetry. 
and you can find Swamp books in university collections um, at places like Brown and Harvard and Smith. And he recently cast type for the Cherokee alphabet, which is the first time this has happened since the 1800s that Cherokee language typeface has existed. Ed has a PhD in philosophy, but also an MFA in poetry from University of Massachusetts Amherst and has a full length poetry collection forthcoming from Hedgerow Press. Please welcome the voice and vision of Ed Rayher. Hi, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I have a letterpress studio in Northfield and uh, I print books for uh, many presses as well as um, publish books myself. And then I run a monotype uh, type foundry. And I'm going to do a screen share to show you some of the things uh, uh, <laughs> that uh, I'm working on and uh, especially Susan's book. Uh, so far the host needs to uh, enable screen sharing. It's enabled now, try again. Okay. Up oh, there we go. There we go. Uh oh, <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of this other stuff here. Um, so what I do is a combination of high tech and low tech. The high tech is I do di digital design and uh, the low tech is letterpress printing, which is now obsolete commercially. And uh, the way I think of the book is a theater where the word is presented. And in the theater, you have the stage and the stage is the paper and how it unfolds, how you move from one scene to the next by turning the pages. And I'm gonna start by showing some uh, earlier work of broadsides we did for the press. And my wife is an illustrator. She um, does, has been doing woodcut prints for us and drawings. And then I will turn to Susan's book and show you uh, some of the things I was doing with Braille because that really fascinated me. So I don't know how many people are familiar with letterpress. So here is an example of a woodblock that my wife did for the uh, um, Psalms broadside and it's a block of uh, rhubarb. On, in the middle is the block. And this is one of the cutting tools. And on the left is the brayer. So the brayer uh, rolls ink over the block. And then if you want to hand print, there are barons both. Uh, this is a traditional uh, bar hand baron and this is a glass baron. So you ink it and then you place the paper on it and then you uh, rub it with the baron. And here's a close up of the wood blocks. This is a raven for the Ararat broadside. And on the right is a section of the uh, rhubarb, I'll move this over. You can see the rhubarb print below it. And here are some of the stages we go through. So the first thing is I ask the artist to make a drawing. And then if the drawing is wor uh, works, then she'll cut what is called the key block. And down below, you'll see the, the print of it. And the key block generally is black ink. And uh, the way the block works is everything that's cut away will not print. So it's a relief process. What is left at the top of the block is what will accept ink and then be printed. And also you have to remember that uh, in the printing process, the uh, image is reversed from the block. So if the raven is facing right in the block, it'll be facing left in the print. And there are some of the very fine tools used. And to get multiple colors, you have to have one block for every single color. So on the left, we have the key block in black. And this is a background block in dark blue, which makes the dark blue in the print. And then on the right, you see the light blue block. So it takes three to make one print. And here you get to see various proofing stages and then the final print down at the right. And the way I print them is with a uh, state-of-the-art 
Vandercook proof press. The block is placed in the bed of the press. These are steel rollers that are the ink fountain. So they will roll over with rubber rollers beneath them, will roll over the block. And then uh, following that is a cylinder on which the paper is uh, placed. So it will print, push the paper into the block in a relief print. And because I do have a letterpress studio, I also have a type foundry. And as uh, mentioned, I did uh, engrave matrices and create Cherokee for the first time in 150 years. But here's an example of letterpress type. It's like what Gutenberg invented or Ben Franklin would have used, or you can see today in many um, letterpress studios. And on the right is the Ararat poem itself. And you can see between the lines are little thin strips of leads, hence the word leading. And here's an example of a large piece of type that uh, was from the uh, title. And part of what I do is I make type and I sell it to other printers across the world. On the left, and uh, what I, there are various forms of uh, making uh, metal type, but I use the Lanston system. And on the left is a keyboard. The keyboard operator types on the keyboard and it punches out a ribbon, sort of like a piano roll, uh, full of holes that are coordinates for the uh, matrix case, which I'll talk about shortly. And the roll paper ribbon goes onto the casting machine, which reads the ribbon with compressed air and then casts the type. And here's a view, to, view looking down on the casting machine of some type that has come out of the uh, machine. And then this is the matrix case. So this is where um, the metal is injected into these slots and that produces the image of the type. But we've gone high tech in the antique typecasting world. And this is the Welliver system and it's run off a Mac. So I have a Mac notebook, which sends the codes to the uh, circuit board, which then controls the solenoids, which allow compressed air to go into the machine to make, to order the type. And then I have various presses, such as the Vandercook. Also down here is a Heidelberg windmill. It runs at 5,000 sheets an hour, and it picks up the paper and deliver, prints it, and then delivers it at the other side. It's an automatic press. So now I want to turn to Susan's book and my uh, concept of tactile theater. So the image in the front, the deer, I printed very deeply into the paper. So you can feel the impression of the deer there. And the cover stock itself is very uh, textured. And one reason why I um, enjoy doing this the way I do is that the tab and slot system, which I use to assemble the books is archival. It uses no glue. So the book is sewn together with linen thread and then uh, doesn't use glue to hold together. Now I'm gonna zoom in on Susan's, Susan's foldout page. So this was done in InDesign, a digital layout program that uh, printers used. So on the left is the poem and on the right is the braille. And not being fluent in braille, <laughs> I had to make a new typeface where it shows the uh, Latin letter beneath the braille so I could proof what I was doing. But I still ran it by Susan because I did make some errors and whatnot. But that gives you an idea of how I figured out what the foldout page would uh, look like. And for this book, I didn't want to use just reg the regular braille dots. I wanted to use deer hoof prints as dots. So in Fontographer, I invented a typeface that is not only braille, but it's braille hoof prints. And here you can see the Bezier diagrams of the hoof prints in uh, Fontographer. And then I output it to a digital font, which then I could use to produce plates. So these are letterpress photopolymer plates. I make a negative on my laser printer and then expose the polymer, which is a plastic on a steel back yellow base. And then once it's exposed to light, the polymer hardens and then the uh, 
the rest of it, it washes away. And there at the lower right, you can see the deer head. This is a close up of the plate showing the deer hoof prints in braille. And this is how it prints. Now this is from the back of the page because the, when you print braille, it's actually an embossing process is what we call it. And from the back, you punch into the paper and that creates a relief on the other side. And so here it is at the front of the book as the introduction. And here's the fold out page. So you get the visual poem on the left and then the braille on the right. And that's, that's the beginning, that's the end, the end. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions or whatnot, we can turn to that. Thank you so much, Ed. I also just want to mention that the, 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 the back page also is the alphabet um, in, in Braille as well. So it's not in the relief. Um, it's, not, it's not readable as Braille, but visually you can see the entire alphabet as well. And um, I don't know why I thought that was important, but there's also a note on the, also the, um, the particulars of the, of the making of Braille as well. If you, and uh, again, I, I so appreciate the, the walk through the forest of the process, or I guess the theater of, the theater of the process is perhaps even a better way to put it that you've been able to share with us today. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I, I do wanna mention, I do wanna mention also that um, what you said about the tactileness is, is, is certainly something that I noted too. Like they're, they're very physical books and that makes for, um, and a really interesting experience of reading them. So Andy, I don't do you want to see if anyone has questions for Ed about the process? Yeah, let's see if anyone, we have a little um, bit of time. Kate has her hand up. Hi, Ed. My yes. curiosity is um, you started with the theater and then you started with the stage. So do you have other titles for things that you've done, the curtains, the lighting center, the audience, the... Uh, sure. Um, you can also do it. I mean, that's one metaphor for describing what I do, but you can also use a cinematic one as well. And the idea is that, you know, you, you want everything else around the book to go away. So that your folk, you know, it's like being in a theater. After a while, you don't notice that there's walls, there are people in front of you, there's something above the stage, something below the stage. You want to be immersed. And part of that process is to make the tactile nature of the papers and the cutouts draw you in. So you're hopefully there's a, all your senses are being engaged as much as possible, visual and tactile. And then the cutouts I see is functioning like a spotlight. They draw your attention. And then as you open the book and move from the cutouts to what's revealed behind them, it's sort of like going from a spotlight to a wider view of the entire stage or more of the stage or a second character comes into play or whatever. And so part of the way to maneuver through a book is it's timing. You know, it's going from one thing to the next through time being, when of course we also have the luxury of going backwards, but you want it to be a journey that goes through time and the, the between the author and the book designer, your attention is being guided through to, to things. And uh, one, one funny example was, uh, some people object to too many blank pages at the beginning of a book. Like 
the fly leaf can just be a colored piece of paper or it could have something printed on it or whatever. And one designer said, well, the, the blank pages be in front of a book are like the lawn before the mansion. You know, the long drive through the woods, through the trees, and then suddenly you get the reveal of the house and you get to the, that part of the journey. And that's basically what the book is. It's, it's being paced with blanks, uh, colored paper, images, whatever. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I hope that helps. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, before I, bef bef before I do my, my kind of closing, I wanna just check, does anyone else have any questions or? There was a one more question, which was, do they take on any, does Ed take on any, this is from Leslie, oh, take yes. on any apprentices or <laughs> internships at the press as part of what, of the work that Slate Roof does or that you do, Ed? Uh, at this point, I'm not taking apprentices. I actually have what's called a printer's devil who's a retired printer who comes in and works with me. And that has been a great help, uh, Bill Susi. He lives very close by. Um, I have had apprentices in the past and I might consider an apprentice in the future. Uh, right now I'm in kind of a transitory stage where uh, between a little cancer scare and the pandemic, I've re, and also getting older, <laughs> I've, uh, trying to figure out what my quote retirement will look like. And I'm going to be a printer and publisher un until, uh, you know, they drag me out of the building. Uh, but I'm going to have to wait a little while before I take on more people. So that's the other answer. Thanks for your questions, everyone. And um, before, I want to now just acknowledge all of our all of our readers today from Slate Roof Press so that you all can acknowledge them. We began our reading earlier today with Audrey Gidman. We heard from Susan Glass, Janet McFadden, Anna Warrock. Richard Woolman, and of course, we've just been hearing about the making, the, the, the theater of the making of books from Ed Raher. Folks, would you, would you all take a moment to unmute and show your appreciation for, for this wonderful theater of poetry that we've been able to engage in today? Wonderful. Thank you. Are inspiring. <laughs> it was awe inspiring. I think that was my mother's voice I just heard. I, yes, couldn't, it was. Agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, everyone, uh, I had been looking forward to this reading from Slate Roof Press, and it certainly today did. It exceeded even my very lofty, lofty expectations and desires. And I'm so grateful to have been able to, for us to be able, for Don, Kim and I to have been able to bring the work of these wonderful poets. And the, as I said, the, the vision of, of how the work gets embodied into these, tactile theaters, as Ed calls them. So that is our prom poems and program for today here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry, another Sunday that you've been able to spend with us. And we're so grateful for your time, your energy, and your deep listening. I look forward to joining y'all next week. May, I decided, was just gonna be a big open mic month. Uh, and loving hearing the poetry, 
all of you being the features. So join us again next Sunday for an open mic where you are the features. The, join us 15 minutes before we gather to start at top of the hour to sign up to be one of our 12 readers, uh, five minutes each, and we'll look forward to hearing your work. Well, the birds outside are calling me as they're, as they're in the rain, and I'll be taking my leave with a, with a, a heart full of poetry today. And again, gratitude to our dear friends at Slate Roof Press for joining us and inspiring us with, with all of your work. Please join us next week. And I hope you all have a very peaceful, wonderful week, however you choose to spend whatever the season is where you live. For folks here in the states where we're living, there's lots and lots of planting going on, but we recognize that we have folks that are in different seasons here in the room. And so however you're inhabiting the season of your life in this moment, may it incorporate poetry every day, be infused this week with poetry. As I say, when I close out every week, be safe out there, take exceptional care of your beloveds and keep writing your remarkable poetry so that you can come back and bring it to us next week. That's right, let's bring the hearts out. My best to all of you. And as we depart, I'm gonna to try to name Say goodbye to the folks as they're heading out. A thank you to Ed Rayher. Mary Mullen, so good to see you today. Oh my gosh, yes. T.A. Niles, great to see you. And Leslie, thanks for your question. And there's my mom. 